First, let's get a better understanding of how Spark works from a high level. All Spark applications are managed via a central point called the driver. The driver is the coordinator of work, distributing it to as many workers as is configured. That driver management is handled through the starting point of any Spark application, the Spark context. All Spark applications are built around this central manager, which is like the conductor of a symphony, orchestrating all the separate pieces of the distributed application so that it runs as smoothly as possible. It builds the execution graph that'll be sent to each worker, scheduling the work across those nodes, taking advantage of any existing data location knowledge, sending the work to the data so as to avoid any unnecessary data movement across the network, and of course, monitoring those tasks for any failures so that it can trigger a rebuild for that portion of the dataset on another worker. There are other jobs that the context must perform, but these are arguably the most important. It should be noted that while there are ways to create multiple Spark contexts within the same process, it's generally not suggested as it could result in unexpected behavior. In the introduction to Spark, when we use the shell to run a simple word count, you might recall that we used a variable named sc to load in the text file. That was a Spark context, which is automatically built and provided by the shell, making it even simpler to interact with our data. However, this convenience is only provided by the shell. A standalone application must build its own Spark context. There's no magical SC variable available in all Spark applications. So, Let's see how we can do this by porting the word count we ran in the shell earlier into a standalone application. I'll be using the Eclipse Scala IDE along with SBT for building. If you need any help with installing either of these, you can refer to the installation section of my Scala Getting Started course. But of course you can use any editor or build tool of your choice. Maven is a common alternative to SBT, especially if you're using the Java API. Now, let's decompose the code to see what's different between here and the shell. Recall that our shell code started at the sc.txt file line. However, as already stated, a standalone app does not have the luxury of a built-in context, thus the extra code before our call to text file. Otherwise, the code from that point on is the same, except for the location where we're saving the output, as that was already created from our shellcode, and the save method would result in a file already exists exception. Moving up from there, you'll see our creation of the Spark context, which is created with a Spark conf object describing the Spark application's configuration. This object can be used to set any key value configuration, and, in our case, we're overriding the name of the application, a common enough action that it has a specialized method. Note that we avoid the verboseness of specifying these objects' entire namespaces via import statements at the top of our file. It should also be of note that there's a slight Java difference here, in that a Java Spark context would be used in place of a Spark context. This can be found under the namespace org.apache.spark.api.java, where a number of other useful objects will be found for use with Spark's Java API. Context also has some convenience constructors, one being an empty constructor, where you can leave configuration to defaults and property files. Other convenience constructors negate the need for a Spark conf object altogether, by the ability to set some of the most common configuration items directly, items such as app name or master node location, to name a couple. However, master location is probably best left to a property file or to be passed in during application submission. That's because master location is one of the most common points of change throughout a Spark application's lifecycle and compiling it into the code is the most final way of setting a configuration item. The order of precedence from highest priority to lowest is setting it in the code, using flags passed into Spark Submit, which we'll discuss shortly, 
setting it in the property files like those we saw in the Spark Distro's conf folder, and falling back to using the defaults built into Spark itself. If you do use a coded Spark conf object as we've done here, you must set it up fully before passing it into the context, as once you submit this object to that context, it's cloned, making it immutable with regards to that context. Any changes made to the original conf object will have no effect to the application. The last important piece of this code is that you'll see the core logic falls under a method named main, taking a string array for application arguments. When Spark runs your code, it specifically looks for this main signature. Now, if you're familiar with Scala, you might know that you can extend the app trait to attain a built-in main function. However, its implementation has been known to cause unexpected results from your Spark application. So, the use of this trait is actually frowned upon. In fact, if used, it'll result in a warning statement. Subclasses of Scala.app may not work correctly. Use a main method instead. As for Python, if it's a trivial application, you can simply write the code to be executed directly, without any mention of main. But, for a non-trivial Python file, you should use if underscore name underscore equals equals quote underscore main underscore end quote for Spark's entry point recognition. Now I can use SBT's package task to compile and package this code into a jar, making sure to note the location of the package jar. The Spark dependency is managed in the build.sbt file with this line, specifying the Spark core package that we're targeting, marking it as provided, which is used to signify to any full packager that the Spark container application will provide the dependency at runtime, cutting down on the need to package more than is necessary. Now, with our jar built, we can submit our application to be executed. This is made simple by a tool in the Spark distribution alongside Spark Shell, Spark-Submit. To use it, we pass in the fully qualified name of the class where our main method lives. Then, we pass in the address of our master node. We'll continue to use our local machine for now, opting to utilize as many cores as possible via the asterisk instead of specifying a number of cores in the brackets. Finally, we provide the path to the jar of the Spark application that we just packaged. And it does work! You may or may not receive an exception as I did, which is due to some conflicts in Windows with Hadoop. This is a known issue, filed under the Spark ticket Spark-8333. It shows the weakness of using Windows for big data projects. It works well enough for playing with the data, but I wouldn't deploy it to Windows in production. But, this error only occurs on Spark Close and is superficial for our purposes. We can go to our saved sort location and see that the data is in fact there. Going back to the submit command, it should be noted that if working in Python, then the submit does not take a class argument and the jar path is replaced by the Python file path. Also, for any application, any space separated arguments following that final jar or Python file will be passed into the main method as the application arguments. If you wanted, you could even make the application more dynamic by accepting the input and output file paths as the application arguments instead of hard coding them.